welcome to our second ever whiskey mentory on the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. I'm Ed. Uh, if you recall, our first whiskey mentory about Prohibition was released exactly one year ago in honor of the 100 year anniversary of that terrible law's enactment. This year, we're doing another absolutely riveting series. Whatever. <laughs> but on a completely new topic. Sourcing. This is part one of three, which will focus on the history of sourcing in the whiskey industry, and then we'll examine this long-standing practice through the lens of an old but also new brand of sourced whiskey. But before we get to all that, Ed's here to start us off by telling us what the hell sourcing actually is and why we should all give a dram. See what I did? Yep, I did. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> and um, anybody who's in corporate America understands that sourcing is a thing. The definition of sourcing basically is taking advantage of purchasing opportunities by continually reviewing current needs. Hmm. A second sourcing of definition is global sourcing, hmm. which is sourcing products and sometimes services irrespective of national boundaries. So that's kind of like the corporate America version of sourcing, which really has not a lot to do with whiskey sourcing. Okay. The term you would use from corporate America that fits better with the sourcing of whiskey is procurement which is the act of obtaining goods and services typically for business purposes. But it can also include the procurement process, which is critically important for companies leading up to their final purchase decisions. So when you look at how source whiskey affects the whiskey industry, I think procurement fits better because what I've seen in my research and the, the distilleries that Scott and I have spoke with is that it's a process of going around and finding what works best for you. Simple and plain. There are companies that package and market their branded whiskeys, but do not do their own distilling. Or in some cases, they do distill, but they don't yet have enough properly aged whiskey to sell. Right. Some buy source whiskey and then use their own aging facilities and methods to enhance them, whether finishing them in different barrels or, you know, using their water to proof it down and so forth. Right. So it's not just sourcing the final product. It could also be just the ingredients. Right. For example, you get a whiskey distillery to, to source a couple barrels of four-year-old rye and then stick it in your own barrel. Mm -hmm. and age it for another six to eight months. And, and put your own water in it to proof it down. Yeah, and, right. Yeah. Well, whatever you want. Or you can get a barrel from one distillery and a barrel from another and blend it together yeah. and make your completely own recipe that only you would have. Right. And I think what people look at the traditional Kentucky bourbon whiskey, Woodford Reserve would fall into that because it's what you would call a farm to glass concept. They have their own acreage. They grow their own corn and rye. Right. They, they're not sourcing. They're not sourcing right. at all. It's currently one of the only spirit companies in the world that makes its own barrels because it's owned by Brown Foreman, who has their own cooperage. Mm. So Woodford Reserve actually makes their own barrels, allowing it to control the entire process of creating its line of products from start to finish in a way that really no other distillery can. Yeah. So what you're saying is most distillers are sourcing in some way. Right. Uh, another one that I want to bring up, Hill Rock, they have their own acreage. They grow their own grains. But I'm pretty sure they have to source their barrels. I don't think they have their own cooperage. Mm. So even the Hill Rock that grows their own product has their own like they have their own malting shed or something. They have something. Yeah, because I think they do floor malting. So yeah. they have this big, yeah. yeah. So they, I mean, Woodford and Hill Rock run in direct contrast to, let's say, you know, a Templeton or a Pinhook or even a uh, Bell Mead who presently source everything. Right. You know, every whiskey company who doesn't have their own acreage on site is sourcing. Crown Royal is a giant in the whiskey industry, mm. produced in Manitoba, Canada. Now, Crown Royal sources 10,000 bushels of rye, corn, and barley daily mm. from the surrounding Manitoba area. 10,000 bushels daily. Mm. So they're constantly after trying to find rye and corn and barley. And it's, it's Canada, so it's not growing season the entire right, time, exactly. the entire year. Right. They also require 750,000 imperial gallons, which is about 900,000 U.S. gallons of water, which is naturally filtered through limestone beneath Lake Winnipeg. Mm. They which have they limestone are, too. Yeah, they're yeah. situated right on it. Yeah. Which is why Crown Royal put their plant there to begin with. Right. And um, I've, Makes sense. I've never had a problem with Crown Royal. No. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very nice drinking whiskey. I think everyone pretty much, ah, yeah, it's not overly complex. Right. right. Though we enjoyed the XO. It's quite good. I guess if I have a fault, I see like a $120 bottle Crown Royal. I'm like, no. Right. <laughs> I automatically say, I'm not doing that. I mean, Crown Royal to me is $30 and you can drink it all day at a wedding. Yeah. And it's delicious. You know, it's, it's no stress to it. And to our Canadian fans, we will do a Canadian whiskey episode at some point. We just haven't got around to it. Right. Though we have given Crown Royal some love. We did. And I think we said, are they the most popular whiskey in America? Ah. Uh, Do they beat Jack or was Jack and then them? I think and it then, was them. I think there were two and that was surprising. We'll look that up real quick and get the right one for you. Yeah. <laughs> but my point is that Crown Royal certainly does not source their whiskey from other places, but they still have to source their ingredients. 
Then you look at a distillery like High West in Utah. Yeah. They get much of their whiskey blends from about a half dozen other distilleries. The majority of which comes from Midwest Grain Products, or MGP, which is based on the former Seagram Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Mm. So High West does have some of their own whiskey, but they like to blend it. So instead of filling up a full bottle with their whiskey, they take MGP and they may put like 50, 60% of MGP's whiskey in, and then they put 40% of theirs to make it their own special proprietary blend. Yeah. And then you have brands like Bullet Rye and Angel's Envy Rye, which are both completely sourced from MGP. Mm. So you go everywhere from Woodford, which is, I don't mean, I don't know where they get their glass bottles from. That might be the one thing they have to buy, but I wouldn't be surprised if they don't have their a, own a bottle company factory. somewhere that makes bottles. I, I right. can't put that past them. I bet you there's some guy blowing Woodford bottles in, in a little shed Hello. somewhere. They're, he's doing what now? <laughs> so, so you go from that, from Woodford, which is completely farm to glass, and then you have Crown Royal, which is sourcing 10,000 bushels of the different grains every day. And it is, I have confirmed, the number two whiskey in America. Right. And that's just show the process at High West. They've embraced sourcing to make their products unique. Like Double Rye is their rye and MGP dry. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that's my breakdown of what sourcing is in corporate America and how sourcing whiskey, whether it's just a barrel or a bottle, the grains themselves, or getting into the actual finished expressions and spirits like Bullet, Angel, and we could list a hundred more. Right. It's true. So a lot of the stuff that you just said has been going on since basically the beginning. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to understand how and why the sourcing of whiskey is even a thing, as Ed just elucidated, you first have to understand how the whiskey industry started in America. And it all began with farming. The first Europeans to settle permanently in what would eventually become the first 13 colonies of the United States of America were the English in 1607, proclaiming their settlement Jamestown, Virginia, and then followed in the next 20 years by the Pilgrims and the Puritans farther north in Massachusetts. And just a side note here, Ed and I are aware that there were several centuries of exploration by Europeans and other areas of the New World before 1607, and that the first humans to arrive on the continent were likely nomadic tribes who crossed the Bering Strait from Asia several millennia ago, but we're focused on on whiskey here and the english settlement in jamestown is where the story of whiskey sourcing begins but i do want to say that i know them people who came across the bearing strait had to come up with something to keep them warm oh they were yeah they were thinking like ferment like horse milk right yeah do penguins make milk maybe penguin milk sounds disgusting <laughs> i've got a nipple greg can you can you, can you milk me <laughs> tastes fishy you can milk anything with a nipple according to gaylord fokker you can <laughs> what a fucker. <laughs> All right. So if you wanted to create a successful settlement anywhere in the new world in the 17th century, you were going to have to establish an agricultural base because yes. if you relied solely on trade with indigenous people and shipments of food from Europe, a perilous three week journey, at least you would probably starve to death. And some settlements failed because of just that very reason. Thus, farmers became the lifeblood of the New World. And from time to time, these farmers, if they were lucky, would reap higher than normal yields. And after using what they needed for themselves and trading it to others in their settlements, they might still have more grain than they knew what to do with it. So, what do you do with it? Well, you transform it into something else. Something that not only lasts longer, but could also be more valuable and enjoyable. Hmm. Alcohol. Right, corn in the cob is fun in the summer, nice little picnic, but it sure don't be bourbon. <laughs> Truth. Mm-hmm. First, they brew beer. But in those pre-pasteurization days, beer would only keep for so long. So the next logical step was to distill the alcohol in that beer into a purer spirit. We don't know who the first person was to distill spirits from grains in America, but it had been going on in Europe and the British Isles for centuries prior to the settlement of Jamestown. Right. And we've talked before about how there was a massive influx of Scots-Irish immigrants in the mid to late 1700s, many of whom already knew how to make whiskey in their homeland using barley. Now, you have to understand that these farmers who were making all this grain and beer and whiskey eventually didn't have any actual money. They used their beer and their whiskey as a kind of currency, bartering with others for goods and services. Furthermore, not every farmer who had excess grain had their own working still, which at this time was very expensive and dangerous piece of equipment. Fermentation produces carbon dioxide gas, which in an improperly constructed still can cause it to explode. Mm. So farmers who didn't have their own still would bring their excess grains to a farmer who did. And they would make it into whiskey. And there you have it. The first instance of sourcing to produce whiskey. And this situation worked out great mm. for everyone until... Duh. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> I sense a tax coming. 
that is correct. Until after the American Revolution, when George Washington, advised by Alexander Hamilton to find a way to pay off the country's war debts, decided to tax all the whiskey. But remember that the whiskey makers didn't have any money, and you can't pay a whiskey tax with whiskey. So these farmer distillers were in a pretty bad spot. Tensions over this taxation rose, and it all came to a head with the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794. See episode 8 for a discussion of that topic. So things came to a head in 1794. A group calling themselves the Whiskey Boys set fire to tax collectors' homes, tarred and feathered tax officers, and basically destroyed anything owned by anyone who proved of or even complied with the tax. Whiskey Boys is the name of Scott and I's musical that we're working on right now. Also, the events leading up to the Whiskey Rebellion, in turn, caused a lot of disgruntled farmer distillers to vacate the rye whiskey-producing areas like Pennsylvania and Maryland and move down to Kentucky. It was a move made all the more enticing by the Corn Patch and Cabin Rights Act, which provided 400 acres to anyone who promised to build cabins on the land and plant corn, a native cereal grain that was easy to grow, and from which people were already creating a newer, lighter, sweeter whiskey that was distinctly different from the bolder, spicier rye. Boldier? Boulder spicy rye from up north. And these new settlers included some famous names you might recognize. Evan Williams. No. Oh. Elijah Craig. Word. Elijah Pepper. Robert Samuels. Jacob Beam. Basil Hayden. Daniel Weller. And the Brown family all settled in the Kentucky area prior to 1800. During the 19th century, things changed as people began to make whiskey not to get rid of excess grain, but to create and sell it purposefully as a product in its own right thus marking the true beginning of the American whiskey business. These new distillers would sell whole barrels to retailers, saloons and shops and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and provide them with glass decanters or bottles etched with the distiller's names so they could have a way of advertising to the consumer which whiskey they were drinking. These new brands included Old Overholt, J.W. Dant, Yellowstone, James E. Pepper, mm-hmm. Old Crow, Ancient Age, Jim Beam, Early Times, and Henry McKenna. The problem with this bottling method, though, is that unscrupulous businesses could simply put cheaper whiskey in the higher end bottles and then charge customers the higher price. Right. Like Fridays did that. Yeah. They got a huge yeah, hot water all across for that. The, the Northeast. Yeah. They put like Jim Beam and shit in upper bottles yeah. and charged high prices for it. Now, how do you do that? How, you know what, ta- how, what type of conspiracy that is to get that done at, 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 at a corporate level? Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Few, I haven't been to a few places where I've taken the drink and I'm in like, hmm. This does not taste what I asked for. Yeah, yeah. And I watched them pour it out of the bottle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you're a borderline alcoholic like Scott and I, you get to acquire a taste for something. <laughs> oh, I don't think they could trick us now. Like if we ordered, right. I don't know, if we ordered a Woodford Reserve and it tasted like Jim Beam, we would fucking know that. I would shit. know right away. Yeah. I'd be like, you are whores. <laughs> I'm not going to name the name because I can't prove anything, but it's a very well-known local um, oh. small franchise like mm-hmm. a six or seven location I place know, i know what you're talking about yeah yeah starts with an o ends with a t okay <laughs> there's only three letters in it <laughs> <laughs> um oh yeah so they could charge the higher price so mm-hmm. also at this time there were whiskey wholesalers who were building dedicated distribution systems different than the whiskey horse sailors right I just mentioned earlier totally different <laughs> uh buying whiskey from local distillers and then selling it at a profit to farther flung retailers on a regional scale made possible by the railroad boom Furthermore, many of these wholesalers became known as rectifiers, combining whiskey from different distillers and bottling them as new products that they could label and market as their own. Sound familiar? (laughs) It's just what you were describing in the intro. And this is in the uh, 1800s. So by the time the Civil War ended in 1865, this modern type of whiskey sourcing was in full swing. But again, there's our problem. And here's perhaps where sourcing's bad reputation started. Dishonest rectifiers were free to bottle concoctions that were mixing only a small amount of actual whiskey with large amounts of neutral spirits, colorings, flavorings, and other ingredients, some of which turned out to be poisonous. Mm. Couple this with the Whiskey Trust scandal during the administration of President Ulysses S. Grant, which saw many small distillers close after being cut out of the market by larger corporations, and then on top of that, Prohibition, which contracted the whiskey industry even further, so much so that by its end in 1933, only 20 million gallons of whiskey remained in the U.S., most of which was owned by a single company with a rest split among only a handful of others. And for the full story of the Prohibition's rise, fall, and fallout, please see last year's four-part Whiskeymentary. Mississippi was the last to hold out. They didn't come around to 1966. Jesus. Are you fucking kidding me? 1966. The Beatles are out before they repealed Prohibition. God damn. Fuck Mississippi for a thousand reasons. All you've given us is Elvis, slavery, and sadness. And now you can't drink? All I would want to do if I was in Mississippi is drink. It's hot. You have fucking mosquitoes the size of your fist. Get your shit together down there. 
And it's this very situation, a whiskey industry dominated by only a handful of major distillers, that pretty much continues to this day. Of course, between then and now, they have been many distilleries, both large and small, who have opened and closed and reopened, but the majority of those distilleries actually started out by sourcing their whiskey from others, including such notable brands as Wild Turkey, Woodford Reserve, who now we know is completely farm to glass, right. and Pappy Van Winkle. Because if there's one inescapable fact about the creating whiskey, it's this. It takes a fucking long time and a lot of effort and expense to ferment, distill, barrel, age, blend, bottle, distribute, and market it. Like we like to say, whiskey is easy to make, but it's hard to make well. Right. So today, who are the distillers providing other companies with all this well-made whiskey? Who, Scott? Well, there's Kentucky Bourbon Distillers in Bardstown, Kentucky. Nice. Also known as Willet. Word. Which we're actually drinking right now. Yep. Will it rye? Yep. Cascade Hollow in Tennessee, also known as George Dickel. Mm -hmm. We highlighted them on a previous episode. And even Heaven Hill and Four Roses are known to provide whiskeys to other companies. Now, most of this is an open secret in the industry, but not well known to consumers, which is perhaps another reason for its bad reputation, a seeming lack of transparency to the uninformed. Of course, no history of sourcing would be complete without mentioning the 800-pound gorilla of sourcing, which Ed actually mentioned earlier, MGP, and we'll be focusing exclusively on their history and hefty contributions to the whiskey business next week in part two. But for now, suffice it to say, and I'm bringing it home, thank you for staying with me. Yep. Whether it's the green or the water or the barrels or even the finished product itself, sourcing in the whiskey industry is decidedly not a new thing, nor was it usually a bad thing. And anyone who tells you different is selling you the historical equivalent of a rectified spirit. <laughs> and a thing that caused a national whiskey industry, what allowed the Elijah Craigs and the Evan Williams to get their brands to flourish was the railroad. Mm -hmm. The railroad changed everything in America, including the whiskey industry. Right. Because now you could take barrels from Kentucky and ship them out east or to New York. And right. before, that would never get there. Yeah, because they had to either travel over land, which took a long time, right. or they had to follow the rivers, which went the other direction. Right. I was looking at some artwork the other day, and they had a, a wedding in the Netherlands, and in the picture was a bowl of oranges. And the symbolism of that was their incredibly valuable fruit right. in the Netherlands. It was a luxury right. item. Right. Yeah. So the same thing, like Kentucky whiskey whiskey in new york before the railroad was a luxury item yeah. like kind of like everything coming out of buffalo trace now <laughs> <laughs> i mean so for buffalo trace nothing's changed from the 1800s before the railroad it's like it's any bottles of buffalo trace that you get a hold on here we whether, go <laughs> whether antique 107 or some eagle rare or god forbid a pappy then you know good for you right good for you you won the lottery right so what's this whiskey that you brought us today scott okay so i wanted a whiskey that would represent what we were talking about and the one i chose here after doing a little bit of research and actually after listening to last year's whiskeymentary um when we mentioned it it's iw harper mm. and i have a little bit of history about that too i know i've done a lot of talking it's okay you can interrupt me okay. with your patented anecdotes well sure i don't know if i'm gonna interrupt you go ahead okay so uh, <laughs> <laughs> classic <laughs> all right iw harper isaac wolf Bernheim, mm. switch it up on you, Yeah, was a German Jew who emigrated to America in 1867 to earn his fortune after hearing stories from his cousins about their experience of moving to the land of opportunity. When he arrived, he was just 19 years old and had $4 in his pocket. His first job was as a peddler of small household items known as Yankee notions, threads, suspenders, handkerchiefs, knickknacks, oh, gadgets, toys, you know, which he carried on horseback to various Pennsylvania towns. But after his horse died... <laughs> Damn. <laughs> During his first winter in America and being unable to afford a new horse. I mean, because horses don't cost $4, even back then. So where do you get the first one? That's a whole other story. Uh, that's true. Hashtag horse stealer. <laughs> he bought a ticket on a steamboat headed to Paducah, Kentucky, where relatives helped him land a job as a bookkeeper for a whiskey company. In 1872, he and his younger brother entered the wholesale spirits industry for themselves. They sourced barrels from local distilleries, created their own brands, and their business quickly grew in size. In 1879, Bernheim Brothers introduced Introduced the I.W. Harper brand. They wanted a name that sounded American, and they knew that Bernheim was way too German and way too Jewish to be popular with many Americans. Unless it's a wheat whiskey from Heaven Hill. Right, they have. They in have the one. 21st century. Right. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> so they combined Isaac's first and middle initials, I.W., with the last name of a famous local horse trainer named John Harper, and a brand was born. You said horse trainer, right? Horse trainer, okay. not whore trainer. This is why we have no sponsors, but go ahead. <laughs> There'll be crickets right after that. <laughs> 
Soon enough, I.W. Harper became their flagship brand, winning gold medals at various international spirits competitions and world's fairs between 1885 and 1907. Oh my God, they had them back there too? They did. In fact, it won so much that it became known as that gold medal whiskey. Wow. By 1915, the Bernheim Brothers Company was valued over a million dollars, which is about $26 million in today's money, and Isaac decided to retire. But he didn't stay idle. He began funding various philanthropic projects, such as providing the residents of his hometown in Germany with a source of fresh running water and purchasing land near Bardstown, Kentucky, and setting up a trust for the Bernheim Forest, which, if you hearken back to our episode on Bakers, we told you that eventual whiskey legends and cousins Fred Booker No and Parker Beam would play as children. I mean, things that come together. I know. It is such a small whiskey world. I.W. Bernheim died in 1945, but I.W. Harper lived on. After Prohibition, the brand had been sold to Shenley Distilling, who marketed it aggressively. And by 1966, I.W. Harper was a household name, gracing the pages of popular men's magazines, appearing on the silver screen, inspiring a clothing line, and enjoyed the world over on ocean liners and in a total of 110 countries. Fast forward to the 1990s, and the brand fell into the hands of Diageo. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Who decided to stop selling it in America due to whiskey's unpopularity at the time, and began focusing on sales in Asia, like he did, where it sold 2 million bottles in Japan alone in 1997. But finally, in 2015, with America's bourbon boom in full swing, Diageo decided to bring back the label to the States, but in order to market it and distribute it at the level they intended, they realized that they were going to have to source it from somebody else. And the source they chose was... Heaven Hill. Ooh. Which couldn't be more appropriate because in a fun bit of whiskey coincidence, the distillery that now provides the whiskey for a brand created by I.W. Bernheim over 140 years ago is called the Bernheim Distillery. <laughs> Unbelievable. Isn't that really cool? I just, it really cool. it's a really fucking cool story. And that's why when I read about this whiskey, I was like, it's sourced. It was originally sourced and it has everything to do with what we're talking about today. Right. The mash bill for this is 73% corn, 18% rye, and 9% malted barley, which is my type of a bourbon. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm dragged to high rye bourbons all the time. But anyway. I don't know barley. who's doing that. You're a grown ass man. You can drink what you want. Uh, I know. But this, <laughs> you know, if I can drink your whiskey. <laughs> um, it's cheaper than drinking my whiskey i found <laughs> so oh so that's what it is boom, 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 boom. and it's funny because heaven hill has some of the best bottom shelf whiskey in the industry mm. what did you pay for this is about 35 dollars. i paid 32 dollars. right so the regular henry mckenna not the tenure is very nice and drinkable mm -hmm. the white label is very drinkable the mellow yellow corn whiskey is very drinkable and all of those are under twenty dollars a bottle and up until recently their bottled and bond expression was super cheap till they right. decided to rebrand it and sell right. it at well, a higher and price their, and their evan william bottled and bond oh, is true. under twenty dollars yeah, that's also true and it's also delicious mm -hmm. for twenty dollars <laughs> right so i'm guessing that they took some of the twenty dollar <laughs> heaven hill stuff and put a thirty five dollar tag on it we're gonna find out i have just so you know i've pulled up breaking bird Bourbon, just to deviate from whiskey jug for mm. for a minute. Okay. First, let's us do it. Let's us do it. Okay. I mean, I vanilla. I absolutely smell banana. You don't smell banana. I don't. Wow, it's so obvious to me. And a lot of people say that Jack Daniels has a banana smell and taste to it. And I can't taste Jack Daniels. And that's all I taste on Jack Daniels by itself is banana. Amazing. And yeah. I usually don't, but this, wow, I really do. There's not a lot to the nose. No, because it's, it's 82 proof. Hardly any alcohol burned in my nose at all. Right. Um, vanilla. Vanilla, of maybe course. some corn, mm. some oak or cork, something maybe, like that. Maybe like a, a an orange peel, like a tiny, just a, a right. spritz. Okay. Uh, mine says light vanilla, corn, and new oak are all present. Nose comes across as really young and makes me think that they're using a bourbon not a day older than four years old, <laughs> which is a bare minimum to be labeled straight bourbon without an age statement. There we go. So the palate. Yeah, I tasted it. it I, I can taste the banana on the palate too. Mm. Are you, it, it does taste immature. I mean, no doubt. There's, yeah, uh, it's not bad. I mean, like if someone gave this to you, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't slap them and knock it off the table, especially if it's neat. 
Yeah, uh, we have some water down, and I'm probably not going to like it because mm-hmm. I I do like this, and I like it. Mm. I like it quite a bit. I like it on the water a little bit because I just you? put it on there. So it's for if I like my whiskey cold, mm. I might actually have to get like a one of those wine fridges for my whiskey. Just put, keep yeah, it put, keep it like fifty. I don't no. like it in the fridge or the freezer, but fridge, no, the fridge is too cold. Like just a little chilled, so I don't have to put ice on it. Right. Um, I like this. This is very nice. It's a medium expression. That's mm. what you're going to get for $32. There is a higher expression. They have a 15 year. So it's a different mash bill and a higher proof. Right. But like you said, though, this was a low rye bourbon, but I taste yeah. a lot of spice on it. it, it it's got some spice in it. Yeah. Too. And that could be the yeast that they use makes right. their shit spicy. Right. Because um, it's certainly not the proofing here. And it's certainly not the rye grains. So it's got to be the oh, yeast. Okay. Breaking bourbon has... Honey, elderflower, really oh vanilla. My God. Um, additionally, I noticed a slight corkiness. I would really like to see what this bourbon tastes like at a hundred proof or higher, since yeah. I feel like a lot more complexity would be revealed. Again, yeah, it's young, and that's what comes to mind when tasting it. So the finish, uh, Georgia peaches, dried raisins, Georgia vanilla. Peaches. I tasted a little bit of what he meant earlier, like pears. Are. A light fruit. For how long it lasts, the finish is short. It's not bad. He says, if I had tasted this blind and you told me the bourbon I was tasting was $35, I would have assumed it was from an upstart distiller due to the how young it tastes and the price. Mm, mm. Knowing that it actually is a mass scale bourbon, I'm surprised and disappointed that Diageo is trying to command the price point it's set. This is realistically a $20 bourbon at most. Wow. It's not bad, but it's nothing special. There are many other bourbons, such as Four Roses Small Batch, Elijah Craig 12-Year, Buffalo Trace, but, at the 30 to 35-year point that I would recommend before recommending oh, this I see one. What, I see what you're saying. When was this written? What, what does that go to matter? Like, well, I oh, think- yeah, I like, got it. I got it. It's 2015. Right. So that's six years ago. Right. So like a $32 bourbon six years ago is a little different than $32 bourbon. All right. Bourbon. That's a good point, You know Scott. what I mean? That's a good point. Like, right. if it was last year, I'd be like, okay, that he has a legitimate beef. Now I think he's just splitting hairs. Well, and his comment about Buffalo Trace is bullshit, because this is better than just basic Buffalo Trace. It's better. Well, you feel that way, but a lot of people worship Buffalo Trace. I know they do, but okay. I- I'm saying that this is better. Well, Buffalo Trace is more than 82, isn't it? Aren't they like 90? Uh, Buffalo Trace is 90. I would agree with you, Scott, if it was 88. But if I have to spend $35, I'm going to get Buffalo Trace before this, because I know it's 90, and I can do more with it. Yeah, but I'm just going on the taste that's in the glass in front of me. Yeah. And from what I remember, Buffalo Trace tasting like the one dimension that I'm remembering from Buffalo Trace. Right. It tastes harsh to me. Okay. There's nothing harsh about this. No, no. It, this is an easy drinking bourbon so that you, anyone's going to would enjoy. Would you put this in the neighborhood of what? Now, the only other 80 proof whiskey. Like Basil Hayden. Basil Hayden is the only one in the dark rye that we drink that are 80 proof. But less spicy. Right. Than a Basil Hayden. But it is sort of one note. It's the caramel vanilla. I get the bananas, but that's still a vanilla sweetness type of thing. I'm not saying it's complex. I'm just saying it's better than Buffalo Trace. I'm going to say this. <laughs> it has a tremendous palate, but it just drops off. There's yeah. not a lot of finish. True. But while it's in your mouth, Agreed. it's complex and very enjoyable. But I'm going to go and I'm going to get all the Heaven Hill bottom shelf and I'm going to try them all first against it. <laughs> And then I'm going to try them mixed against it until I figure out what what it is, what they did. (laughs) I want to know what I'm drinking because I can't believe they made a whole new spirit for IW Harbor. That that, that would be a fun experiment. Right. So do you have anything else to say about sourcing? I don't think so. Well, not, not today. Okay. That's the history of sourcing. And we're going to come back. And talk about the elephant in the room, which is MGP. Yeah. Which Scott and I have our own opinions on. Mostly positive, by the way. Right. And also talk a little bit about why it's so uh, contentious. Yes. Like why people kind of shit on it. Why they don't like it. Why it has a bad reputation. So just so you know, we're recording this. It's 8.30 at night on New Year's Eve. Happy New Year's, everyone. Happy New Year's. Uh, I know you're hearing this a week later, but the point is we're about to go get foobard. (laughs) (laughs) Beer, beer, beer. (laughs) (laughs) We have- um, Oh, we got lots of whiskey. (laughs) We have Will at Rye. We have the rest of the I.W. Harper. Uh, Wait, Weller Special Reserve. Mm -hmm. Kinsey Zinfandel Finish, which is one of my favorite- off the grid whiskeys that no one else knows about. And we have at least more than half of all the whiskeys that we're going to have on our Whiskey Madness right. 2021 right. episodes. We've allowed ourselves right. to drink half the bottle before the Whiskey Madness starts. <laughs> because like, oh, we have plenty of this. Because Fine. we're like fucking assholes. <laughs> So we're like, ah, so as long as we have a half a bottle before Whiskey Madness starts, we're fine. So we're going to drink all that tonight, too. So we have about, we're going to be up to like, until we pass out. So I'm thinking about one. Oh, no, four. Four. (laughs) So um, 
Four, you got cocaine? Uh, um, I'm just kidding. We don't do cocaine. Shh. I'm way... My heart's way too heavy for that. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. For the Whiskey <laughs> Tangent Podcast, thank you so much for listening to our first episode of the Whiskey Mentory. I'm Ed. I'm Scott. And we will see you for part two. Happy New Year, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>